ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hello, I'm Julia Baird. And I'm Jeremy Fernandez, and we want to let you know about our pod. It's called Not Stupid, where every week we chat about the stories that we're a bit obsessed with. It's part news, part internet rabbit holes, basically, Jules. (laughs) And a lot of chat about poetry and cake, actually. It's called Not Stupid. You can find it on the ABC Listen app. It was quick and chaotic. The South Korean leader ordered military rule, sending troops onto the streets. Then, facing widespread anger, he backtracked. So what on earth was President Yoon suk Yul trying to achieve? What does it mean for the stability of the nation and the region? Today, Kiyun Moon Hwang from the ANU. He was in the capital Seoul when it all unfolded. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal Land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. South Koreans are reacting with shock and anger after the country's president declared martial law. This is the moment troops entered the parliament compound in Seoul after the edict was issued. The first since the 1980s, when South Korea was under a dictatorship. South Koreans gathered late at night outside parliament in Seoul, calling for the impeachment of their president. Kyung, it was an incredible 24 hours or so in South Korea. You just happened, I guess, to be there. Yeah. Just tell me what you saw. It's just amazing. Well, by the time I got there, the crowd had dissipated considerably compared to what had gathered about two or three hours earlier. The National Assembly compound was locked and people were uh, around the gates, gathered, uh, they were on stage, singing, giving speeches, typical South Korean protest culture. But because I uh, stay very close in the National Assembly complex area, I go into the National Assembly compound pretty frequently for various purposes, and it was kind of jarring to see that that was no longer possible, that it was locked and everything was prohibited. Oh my gosh, yeah. So let's just chat about how this actually unfolded. On Tuesday evening, President Yoon suk Yul put in place emergency martial law. I declare martial law to protect the Free Republic of Korea from the threat of North Korean communist forces to eradicate the despicable pro-North Korean anti-state forces that are plundering the freedom and happiness of our people and to protect the free constitutional order. This is just you know, baffling at every level why he did this or how he did this. He clearly lost his mind mm. and The question is how he lost his mind, why he lost his mind. And and so that's the beginning of the uh, fast-moving repercussions to come. So he he declares martial law. And then the amazing thing is there's this absolute mad scramble by politicians in South Korea to get to the parliament to try and overturn this ruling, to vote against it. They're climbing over fences to get there. It's amazing, isn't it? Right. You're not going to get away with this kind of thing anymore in South Korea. I mean, the the demonstrations from eight years ago that led to the impeachment of the previous conservative president clearly showed that, that people are not going to just lie down Mm. and take this. Park Geun-hye was accused of colluding with her friend and confidant Chae Soon-chil to embezzle money from the nation's top companies. The judges announce a unanimous decision. We remove Park Yuen Hare from office. I think the fact that, you know, scarily, uh, paratroopers or at least troops were mobilized on helicopters and they were flown into the grounds of the National Assembly to block access to the National Assembly 
uh, show that this has been planned, planned in terms of taking out the processes that mm. would stop the martial law from being implemented. The law shows clearly that the National Assembly can overturn with a simple majority a martial law decree. Again, he's either lost his mind or he's deeply just stupid to think that he could get away with this. Right. Okay. So at 1 a.m. on Wednesday morning, the South Korean Parliament did overturn that declaration of martial law. In accordance with the National Assembly's decision, the president must immediately lift martial law. The declaration of martial law is now invalid. The protesters, of course, were gathered outside. I think the troops, as I understand it, were getting a little confused about what they were actually meant to be doing. <laughs> Right, right. These trips are in their 20s, maybe uh, maybe even younger, you know, because there's mandatory conscription here. And they must have been thinking, what the hell am I supposed to do yes, here? I wasn't gosh. trained to do this kind of thing. Yes. And they certainly didn't experience uh, this kind of thing uh, happening, you know, 40 years ago. And so it must have been just really bizarre to them as well. <laughs> We have this long history of dictatorship in South Korea mm. and much of that, or most of that was military dictatorship. Uh, and so this was not that unusual uh, back in the 1960s, and especially 70s and 80s, mm. uh, before the final democratization breakthrough in 1987. Uh, but because of that history of dictatorship, there are very stringent safeguards put into the legal system here and into the constitution that would prevent anything like this uh, from being reinstituted unless it was an absolute emergency and actually a military emergency. Yeah, all right. So the president, of course, then backs down and he reverses the decision. <laughs> well, he, when he first announced his reversal, he said that I would plan to uh, abide by the National Assembly's vote, but it can't be finalized yet because the state council, which is the top uh, executives and ministers, that is supposed to confirm this kind of rescinding of the martial law. He said that not enough of them had gathered to make that formal. Right. But of course, he should have gone through them in the first place to implement the mm. martial law. And it appears he didn't do that either. I mean, it's baffling, as you say. But why did he do it? Why did he say he did it? What was the justification that he gave the Korean people? So the justification uh, was very general, but it was interesting. Through this martial law, I will rebuild and protect the Free Republic of Korea, which is falling into the abyss of national ruin. To this end, I will definitely eradicate the anti-state forces. He said that the opposition was engaged in plans or conspiracy to overthrow the South Korean democratic system. And, uh, of course, that's uh, just a kind of platitude almost, uh, generality. Uh, but he also brought out the old card from the dictatorship days of a communist threat or mm -hmm. communist imminent insurrection. And so that was just bizarre as well to hear that. And, of course, the news outlets quickly checked with the military command centers and confirmed that there was nothing like that going on. And so that just adds another mm. uh, dimension to this that's just crazy. Yeah. And he is, we'll come to this in a moment, but he is deeply unpopular and he has a rather large problem, doesn't he? Because the opposition actually controls the National Assembly and they have been blocking government plans, government bills. So his argument in part was the opposition's trying to paralyse my administration and that's why I need martial law. Yeah, um, he didn't say that that specifically, no. but um, he has been deeply unpopular. And not only does the opposition control the uh, National Assembly, but it overwhelmingly uh, controls the National Assembly. And so there's been gridlock for all kinds of things. The president's approval rating is sitting at about 17%. Right. So you can't get much lower than that. So just tell me what is going on. He's only been there since 2022. Part of this relates to his wife That's right. accepting a Dior bag. Just tell me about that. Well, the Dior bag, I think, is, is really um, just the tip of the iceberg. And ultimately, it's yeah. not that important, I think. I mean, she might have broken a law. Again, these are very strict laws against corruption and bribery that are in place in South Korea because 
of the uh, problematic history, to say the least, of dictatorship. But it's all kinds of other things that she appears to have uh, done that were probably illegal, and that is to interfere in uh, election processes. She appears to have maybe interfered in government contracts being awarded, and all these things that she promised actually she wouldn't do before the election when these controversies surrounding her first surfaced. And so that probably has uh, much to do with his popularity, maybe even half of the <laughs> ingredients that go into his unpopularity. Mm. And the other factors are uh, the uh, inflation, of course, which has been a universal thing, but also the uh, troubles with the doctors who have gone on strike or, or work stoppages, the problems with uh, the president's own misdeeds. So all those things have contributed to uh, his very low approval ratings, yes. Well, Kyung, let's look then at the stability of South Korea, because I think there was a sigh of relief among Western leaders that the martial law had been lifted. It was a really concerning thing to have done in a democracy like South Korea. Right. So, you know, democracy there is vital, isn't it, given its neighbour is North Korea. There are 30,000 American troops based there. It's one of the United States' most important allies yes. in Asia. So this is a really concerning thing that happened. Yeah, so the implications of this are many. The stock market uh, has taken a huge hit. The exchange rate, the Korean exchange rate to the dollar, the US dollar especially, has taken a big hit. But then there are also the security implications as well, as particularly because of the new... Uh, administration coming in in the U.S. And so that's the foremost concern to many people here. Uh, The military being used for these political purposes was supposed to have been a thing of the past, a deep past in South Korea. And to see this happening again, it's like, you know, transporting the people of South Korea back in time through a time machine. Um, It's just really uh, absurd and bizarre and, of course, deeply embarrassing and and shameful. Yeah. So what was President Yoon, do you think, really up to? Was he trying to subvert democracy, trying to seize power? What was his purpose? (sighs) That's what people are trying to (laughs) figure out right now. I've noticed, and I've told people this, that uh, over the past couple of years, but even before when when he was running for president, that he was not an ideological stalwart of the conservatives. Uh, He didn't uh, have anything in his background that suggested that, but he became very famous and popular for opposing many of the moves by the previous president, who was the progressive president. And so the conservatives latched on to him. Uh, but more importantly, he became captured by them, and not just the conservatives, but the kind of hardcore conservative wing. Um, and this was manifested in the way he spoke, some of the things that he did, and it became more severe, one could notice, uh, over time. And so I think in that way, it was somewhat gradual. Uh, but even his staunchest, most conservative supporters, I think most of them could not have imagined something like this happening. And so what triggered this? And I think it was probably uh, this kind of siege mentality and he just went nuts. Mm, sure did. All right. So tell me then what happens next. Is uh, there any possibility, do you think, that he can hold on to his position as president? No, I I would be shocked if he is not out of office within the next week. Mm-hmm. Um, so if he could recover his sanity and, you know, maybe he would decide to resign very soon. That would be the best thing for everybody uh, out of this terrible circumstance. But if, if he doesn't resign immediately, the impeachment, uh, which has already been announced by the opposition party, will quickly pass, even with, uh, a, if I would say, majority, if not almost all the... Uh, president's party joining in. I think the larger question is whether he will be prosecuted thereafter. They're calling out sedition uh, in addition to other crimes that he might have committed, along with other people in the top military uh, who helped him plan this. Mm, South Koreans won't have their democracy messed with, that's for sure. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I think that was proven eight years ago, and I guess this man did not learn that lesson. Kyung Moon Hwang is the Korea Foundation Professor at the ANU and the Director of the ANU Career Institute. This episode was produced by Sydney Peed. Audio production by Cara Jensen McKinnon. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. Thanks for listening. <laughs>